All right, so here's why lighting matters. Key light. A little bit of color on the side and fill. So I gotta eat my lunch before I do this. What's up guys, my name is Harrison Tarabella and if you are new to this channel, I run a very small production company in Birmingham, Alabama. We make 100% of our profit from video, not photography, and we specialize in documentary filmmaking and outdoor adventure work. So why did I buy the R3 in the first place? That's a great question. I do a lot of documentary work in foreign countries. The C70 is phenomenal, I'll bring that down to do my piece to cameras but I found a need for something smaller than the C70 that would have a much lower profile when I'm out walking around filming B-roll. Typically I use my C70 for piece to cameras just because it has things like XLR, I'm able to run in like a Rode NTG5 like I'm recording audio on right now. Um, whereas even though this is a big camera by mirrorless standards, it draws way less of a profile because if someone sees me out with a C70, they think he's shooting a documentary he's shooting a movie or just he's filming but if they see me with this r3 they just think oh that guy has a camera he's walking around taking photos my all-time favorite camera was the 1dx mark ii it is in no way the best camera i've ever used but something about it the 1dx made me happy um it didn't even have log profiles it was just a chunk of metal that could take photos and take videos and it would never stop working is it just worked you could hold it under a water faucet, you could drop it in mud, it would take photos no matter what, and it would take videos no matter what. And that was the most valuable thing about that camera to me. On any job I took it to, I knew that it was gonna do the work I needed it to do. So fast forward a few years later, uh, I'm now mainly shooting with Blackmagic cameras and I have an R5 to take stills. It got to a point where it was just so cumbersome for what I do because I was having to lug around these cameras that could only shoot video and then I had this little camera with me that could take photos. And the R5 can do phenomenal video, but for professional work there were a lot of things about it that were not great and I ran into a lot of problems with the R5. I, I never loved using the R5. I had it in my backpack. and. I, I got some great, great footage with the R5, but I was never happy to use the R5 like I was happy to use the 1DX Mark II. So after searching around, I kind of figured that the R3 would be the best hybrid camera that Canon offers. And I know a lot of you might be thinking, what about the R5C? There's a lot of issues I have with the R5C that I just don't think it would work for me personally. First off, all of the marketing behind the R5C is that it is the best hybrid camera on the market. To actually get it to work for video, you need to rig it up. You need to have an external battery. If you put a V-mount on the R5C, you can't really take photos with it anymore. Like you can, but that's not an enjoyable experience to have this huge camera with a brick battery on the back that you're then trying to awkwardly hold and take photos with. So to actually get the full capabilities for video out of the R5C, it's not really a hybrid anymore. You've just rigged it up into a little cinema camera. Also from the research I was doing, to flip between the photo and video modes on the R5C and reboot the camera and have the operating system switch over, it takes like 10 to 15 seconds, which that isn't a lot of time, but this is instant. You just switch from photo to video, you're good to go. And whenever I would find myself in a situation where I was needing to do hybrid shooting and take photos and videos, if I had to wait 15 seconds to switch back and forth and I was doing that a lot, I would probably lose 50% of what I was trying to shoot just by waiting on my camera to reboot. I really wanted to revisit the days where I could take one camera with me and just be happy. For me, it reminds me of the old days where I was first really starting to make money in video with my 1DX and it, it, maybe it's wrong to sentimentally purchase a camera, 
but it really did just remind me of my favorite camera ever. Oh, another reason is that the year was ending and I really needed another tax write-off. Um, this is a great one. So the three most important things about this camera for me are the image quality, the battery life, and the durability. The image out of this camera is phenomenal and I typically shoot 6K raw. Um, it, it can shoot 6K raw up to 60 frames a second. And the way I've been describing this camera to people, it's like you took a Blackmagic 6K and you just put it into a Canon body because the image is so good. If you had told me in 2014 that I could have a camera that shoots 6K raw video up to 60 frames a second in a body that is this small and it has full autofocus it has image stabilization. I would have thought you were crazy. In 2014, we couldn't even point cameras at a brick wall. And now we have things like this. So this is seriously the best image out of any Canon camera I think I have ever used. The other thing for me is the durability. Um, I literally used to clean off my 1DX Mark II by holding it under a water faucet. Um, haven't done that yet with this. I think just intrinsically, I trust mirrorless cameras a little bit less than I did DSLRs. It feels much more durable than the R5 did or an R6. If I'm gonna have a camera with me that's jostling around in my backpack or I'm going hiking or I'm gonna, you know, I'm going to drop this. I think I have dropped it already. It needs to be able to outlast what I throw at it um, and this can take it. Then that brings us to battery life. It uses these big boy batteries, and these things are phenomenal. Granted, if you're gonna shoot 6K raw like I do, the power draw out of these is considerably higher than if you shoot the 10-bit, but that's something I'm willing to compromise on because I do have a lot of these. They're kind of expensive. I think they're like $120 a pop, but the battery life on these is phenomenal. The last job I was on where I was in the Dominican Republic, we were filming B-roll all day in this Haitian community. And I was switching between photos and videos. And it, it was pretty casual. Um, I was just floating around. I didn't have a shot list. But the entire day, I used one of these batteries. And I don't even think it drained all the way. I think it got down to like the last bar. So the battery life is phenomenal. All right, now we've got really cool things about this camera that are not necessarily reasons I bought it, but they are really cool and I like them. So, just like the 1DX Mark II, this camera has an internal GPS, which is really cool because if you open your photos in Lightroom, you can press M for map and it pulls up a map and you can see exact latitude and longitude coordinates of every single photo you've taken with this camera. Um, super cool, but I actually don't use Lightroom, so. I have that feature. Um, I wish Capture One would implement a map like that because it's really cool to be able to just pull up a map and see exactly where on earth you took all your photos, like down to the foot. Super cool feature, uh, but I wouldn't buy this camera for that feature alone. Another really cool feature of this camera is the eye tracking focus. So this is one of the main selling features of this camera is that it can actually track your eyeball through the viewfinder and whatever you're looking at, it's gonna move that focus point right to where you're looking. Um, I almost expected this to be a gimmick. It works incredibly well. It doesn't work at all for video though, so since I bought this because all of my work is video, uh, I don't use it a ton, but when I take photos, I definitely appreciate having that as an option. All right, the last really nice thing I'm gonna say about this camera, because there are some bad things to say about it, it doesn't have a 30 minute time limit. That's crazy, for Canon at least. Credit where credit is due, I guess. Good for them for finally doing something. There's a, I think it's capped at a four hour limit, which is weird, but I have never once recorded for four hours straight. So good for them for not doing the 30 minute limit like they normally do, but that is such a low bar that I even, I hesitate to even want to give that praise. There are a few things that I truly don't like about this camera. I know I've been hyping it up and I try to walk this line of being positive, but I also don't want to let the fact that I sunk $6,000 into this purchase brainwash me into thinking I love everything about it. Um, there are truly some things about this that suck. I'm gonna start minor and I'm gonna work my way up to uh, like minor inconveniences to things that actually impact me being able to do work with this camera. The first of those 
This has a CFast Express slot and an SD slot. I wish they would have just done two CF Express slots because the amount of data coming off of this camera, why in the world would you put an SD card in it? Um, even the V90 cards, it's just like 6K raw video and they put an SD card slot. I don't understand why camera manufacturers always do the one expensive card slot and then still give it an SD slot because then you can't actually write redundant files, which is absurd. I'm not gonna buy a $6,000 camera and then be like, oh no, I don't have enough money left and cheap out and buy crappy SD cards. Like, this is a professional piece of equipment. I'm gonna use professional cards in it. Give me two slots. I actually ranted about that a little bit more than I expected, but it's really frustrating that I just have that SD slot and I'm never gonna use it. So working my way up my list of inconveniences, I really wish this had a waveform. And I, I know that that is truthfully a lot to ask because a waveform in a camera that's not cinema oriented is actually pretty rare. Um, it, it would be nice though. I don't really have a lot more to say than that. I would really, really like a waveform in this. All right, now we're into things that are actual problems for me. So, it is 2023. This shoots 6K professional video, raw, and it has a micro HDMI port. Micro HDMI. Do you know how horrible that is? Um, I have an adapter around here somewhere, but it feels so flimsy. So many cameras now have full-size HDMI. I, I don't understand. I genuinely do not understand why this has micro HDMI. All right, another thing that, this is not just this camera, this is Canon in general. Uh, why does the shooting info vanish once you start recording? Like, I know there's no waveform, but there's a histogram. So histogram is kind of useful. Um, you know what else is useful? The level to make sure everything's upright. That'd be super cool if we could see that. Um, look at this. So, look at all, hold on, let me tap to focus. Look at all this beautiful, beautiful shooting info right here on the screen. And now I wanna start recording. So, record, it vanishes. How considerate of Canon that we still get our audio. So nice of them, so nice. This is $6,000. I can't see a level. I can't see a level. I'm gonna get in really close for this. Canon, stop. I don't know why. I don't know why all the information disappears. You have to stop, please. My top complaint about this camera, um, and this is still actually a complaint, that applies to Canon overall. It's a shame that the footage from Canon looks so pretty because now that I think about it, all my issues with this camera are actually with Canon as a brand and not the camera. But why is there no C-Log2? Um, so here's the thing, 95% of what I shoot with this camera is raw. When you process the raw footage, it automatically decodes as C-Raw2. So most of the time, this isn't even a problem but then I want to do things like shoot slow-mo, like extreme slow-mo, so 120 frames a second, which I actually almost never do. But when I do that, I drop down into 4K. It has to be 10-bit, which is fine, because 10-bit is really good. But I'm stuck with C-Log3. Or if I want to shoot, uh, I was testing out the other day some of the HD 240 frames a second, which actually looks really nice. C-Log3. Like the amount of processing power that this camera has, it can take 30 frames a second, it can shoot 6K raw. You can put a different gamma curve in there. Like it's not a difficult thing to do, I'm sure. Sony puts S-Log3 in literally everything, literally everything. There was S-Log3 in the A6300 that I had and it could not even support the amount of data that that gamma curve required. And if you tried to color grade it, it would just fall apart, but it was still there. This, this can handle C-Log2. I, I know for a fact it can handle C-Log2. Why is it not there? 
Why? Why is it not there? I really, really like this camera. It makes me genuinely happy to use, and the frustrations I have with it, I'm still able to get beautiful images out of it, and that's the thing. It's 2023, guys. Any camera you buy, it's gonna, it's gonna look great. It's more about how you light things, how you color things. So in conclusion, I think this is actually Canon's best hybrid camera they offer. If you're considering this or the R5C, I would strongly recommend you to get this instead. The R3 is what the R5C claims to be. It's an incredible hybrid camera that you don't have to rig up at all, and it can shoot beautiful photos and truly professional video. This is what's coming in my bag with me because this little camera uh, packs a big punch. So it also makes a great tax write-off.